Hello and welcome to this online CPD presentation on acoustics. My name is Andrew Way and I am manager of light gauge construction and product assessment at the Steel Construction Institute. During the course of this presentation I will be talking about the topics listed on the slide in relation to acoustic performance and sound insulation within a building. Sound insulation is an important design consideration in many types of building, but particularly schools, hospitals and residential properties. Sound insulation can refer to preventing sound from moving from one part of a building to another, such as adjacent classrooms in a school building, or it could refer to preventing noise from entering the building from external sources, such as traffic and aircraft. The diagram shown on the slide shows many sources of noise that can affect a building and how these sources of noise may move around the building, affecting the occupants. The behaviour of sound and the science of acoustics can be quite a complex behaviour because of the many factors that can influence sound performance. However, the structural engineer's role within acoustic detailing is usually relatively simple. In a steel frame building, the sound insulation performance will be very dependent upon the detailing that is applied. For example, the solution that is used for the structural um, floor system can be improved in terms of sound insulation by applying floor treatments above and ceiling finishes below the structural floor. In a steel frame building, the walls are likely to be non-load bearing and of light steel frame construction. These can be selected from manufacturer's catalogues to give the necessary sound performance. So let's start with some basics about sound and how it behaves. Firstly, what is sound? Sound is created when objects vibrate in air. This creates a pressure wave which is then detected by the human ear. The two important characteristics of sound are sound level or loudness measured in decibels or sound pitch or frequency measured in hertz and these are very important for the human perception about sound. The decibel scale reflects the human ability to hear and starts at zero, which is the threshold of human hearing. The decibel scale is a logarithmic scale, which means that small increases in decibels can be very significant. For example, a 10 decibel increase in sound can actually feel like a doubling in the sound level to the human ear. Listed on the slide are several everyday activities and their associated sound levels in decibels. We have people talking there at 65 decibels and further up the scale a lawnmower at 95 decibels. The 30 decibel difference between these two values can actually feel like an 8 times increase in sound level to the human ear due to the logarithmic scale which the decibel is measured on. So let's look at frequency now. And the important thing to realise about frequency is that most everyday sounds are made up of a mixture of frequencies and different frequencies at different sound levels. And the other thing about frequency is that the human ear is more susceptible to some frequencies than others. And on top of that, sound insulation materials are usually better at insulating against some frequencies than others. It is usually the case that low frequency sounds are insulated less than the high frequency sounds. The frequency scale is again measured on a logarithmic scale. The diagram on the slide shows frequencies associated with a normal piano keyboard. Sound insulation testing in buildings is carried out at a range of frequencies to reflect these variations across the scale. Typically sound insulation tests will be carried out in a range between 100 Hz and 1.5 kHz. Acoustic detailing in buildings needs to consider the different types of sound, airborne sound and impact sound. Airborne sound, such as music and voices, is important for both walls and floors to attenuate. Impact sound, such as footsteps, is really only important for floors. The diagram on the slide shows some typical sound insulation testing equipment, speakers, microphones and a tapping machine for impact sound. Airborne sound insulation can be measured on site or in a laboratory. The basic test procedure involves creating a noise in the source room and then measuring the sound level in the adjacent room, the receiving room. 
the noise is created at different frequencies, again to reflect the different performance at different frequencies. The difference between the two noise levels in the two rooms is termed D. This result is normally adjusted for a standard reverberation time of 0.5 seconds and this is given the term D subscript NT. A typical airborne sound insulation test results graph is shown on this slide. As you can see, the insulation performance of the item being tested in this case varies with frequency. The sound reduction for the low frequency sounds are less than for the high frequency sounds. There are standard procedures for sound insulation testing and these are given in BSEN ISO 140-3 if it's a laboratory testing and dash 4 for on-site testing. Sound insulation of impact sound is carried out slightly differently. In this case a tapping machine is used in the source room and the sound pressure level is measured in the room below. The sound level measured in the room below, the receiving room, is termed L. Again this result is adjusted for a standard reverberation time of 0.5 seconds and this value is given a term L subscript NT. Again, impact sound can be measured on site or in a laboratory. This slide shows a standard result for an impact sound test. Again, you can see the variation with the sound level across the frequency range. And again, standard procedures have been followed according to the standards. To compare sound insulation results, the graph is not the easiest tool to use and therefore single figure ratings are required. To convert the graph results into a single figure rating an A-weighted reference curve is used which is intended to reflect the perception of the human ear across the frequency range. The procedure to convert to the graph into a single figure reference is quite a complex procedure but in most cases the engineer will not be required to carry out this procedure as the test result will give both the graph and also the single figure rating associated with it. When looking at performance data it is important to consider the differences between airborne sound figures and impact sound figures. The most important one of these is that for airborne sound higher test values equate to better insulation whereas for impact sound lower test values equate to better sound insulation. There are different terms used depending on whether the measurement has been taken on site or in a laboratory. For airborne sound the single figure rating is DNTW for site tests and RW for lab results. For impact sound the site test is termed LNTW and for a lab result the impact sound is just LNW. Sound insulation in buildings needs to consider the different sound paths that are open to sound movement around the building. The most obvious is the direct sound transmission, for example directly through a wall. But also there are paths that sound can take which go round this separating element and this is termed flanking transmission. It is important that both of these sound paths are considered in the detailing for the building. There are three important characteristics to providing sound insulation within a building. The first of these is mass. Mass helps to provide sound insulation. The second of these is isolation, so providing separate layers of material is also a good idea. And the third of these is sealing, so ensuring there are no gaps at the joints areas. So looking at mass in more detail. The mass law states that the more mass that is provided, the better the sound insulation. There are a variety of expressions that are used for the mass law for sound insulation in buildings. However, the mass law is only really applicable to solid elements of uniform mass, which isn't particularly common for common construction methods. Also, the more mass that you add, the less of an effect it has. So each doubling in mass can be approximated to a 5 dB increase in sound insulation. If we look at the diagram on the slide, we can see that one layer of plasterboard might provide 5 dB of sound insulation. And if we double that up to two layers, that can give us 3 dB of sound insulation. If we had four layers of plasterboard all close together, we would probably only get about 35 dB of sound insulation. 
However, if we provide the principle of isolation to our sound insulation and actually use separate layers in our construction, we can actually get a vastly improved sound insulation. So the final diagram there shows two layers of plasterboard separated with a cavity with some insulation between and then another two layers of plasterboard. This construction can give us 60 dB of sound insulation. So therefore, mass alone is not the solution. It is much more effective if we combine this with isolation of separate layers. Sealing and good junction detailing is important to ensure good performance in a building. The principles of good junction detailing ensure that flanking sound is controlled. The principle includes ensuring that any joints are sealed with taped or acoustic sealants and also foam isolation strips can be used. Also any unnecessary contact between components should be avoided and any breaches of cavities or isolation layers it is important that these are avoided. For example mortar build up on wall ties in a cavity wall construction can form a bridge for the sound. So having had a look at some of the principles of sound insulation and detailing we will actually now look at some of the regulations and the requirements that it will be necessary to satisfy in common building types. In residential buildings the requirements are generally given in building regulations. In many other types of buildings the building regulations do not cover specific requirements and therefore it will be mainly down to client specifications. For residential buildings in England and Wales it is part E of the building regulations that presents the requirements and approved document E actually gives the values that are required in terms of sound insulation performance. There are similar standards and requirements in Scotland and in Northern Ireland. The table on the slide shows some of the requirements taken from approved document E. So for separating walls and floors in a purpose-built dwelling or house, the airborne sound insulation performance requirement is that DNTW plus CTR is greater than 45 dB. For internal walls and floors, the RW value should be greater than 40. The CTR term is a spectrum adaptation term used to counteract low frequency sounds. It's normally in the region of minus 5 dB to minus 12 dB, but depends on the construction used and also the room size. For impact sound, separating floors and stairs in a purpose-built dwelling should achieve an LNTW value of less than 62. There are two methods for demonstrating compliance with the regulations. The first one, pre-completion testing or PCT, and the second one, robust details. For PCT, the building may be constructed with any details that the engineer deems appropriate. However, on-site acoustic testing must be carried out at the pre-completion stage to ensure that the necessary acoustic performance has been achieved. For robust details, no pre-completion testing or on-site acoustic testing is required, but the building must be constructed using robust details. Robust details are a series of construction details that have been pre-approved by an extensive series of on-site testing themselves. The Robust Details Handbook is available from Robust Details Limited and includes a whole series of construction details for many forms of construction, including steel frames. For school buildings, there are no specific requirements given in the building regulations. However, the reader is referred to Building Bulletin 93, The Acoustic Design of Schools, published by the Department for Education. This document includes requirements such as sound insulation between rooms, reverberation requirements and requirements related to the transmission of speech in classrooms. For hospitals there is no reference given in the building regulations but it is the Department of Health Technical Memorandum 0801 Acoustics which should be used for guidance. This document replaces the previous HTM 2045 and HTM 56 on partitions. There is also a, another document, Technical Manual 4032, 
but the guidance and information given in this document is almost identical to that given in HTM 0801. These documents give requirements for hospitals related to noise levels from external sources such as building services and sound insulation between rooms. Also there is requirements related to public announcement systems. Requirements for commercial buildings such as offices, leisure and industrial buildings are not covered by the building regulations. For these types of buildings BS 8233, the Code of Practice for Sound Insulation and Noise Reduction in Buildings, might be useful. For offices, the BCO Guide to Specification gives guidance, but in many cases it will be client-specific specifications that are required to be followed. The sound insulation requirements will depend greatly on the type of building being constructed. For example, in cinemas, the walls between auditoria are typically required to achieve an RW value of greater than 74 dB. So moving on now to actually have a look at some forms of construction and what are the typical sound insulation performance they will achieve. In terms of walls, there are three types of walls that can be categorised for sound insulation requirements. External walls, which are required to prevent sound entering a building. Separating walls, which are placed between separate dwellings for example and internal walls, walls within a single dwelling and these have a lesser requirement. For this presentation we are talking about steel frame buildings and therefore the walls in these buildings will be non-load bearing generally. Therefore the designer has a choice on what types of wall construction to use. Typically they may be light steel frame walls or blockwork separating walls. This type of wall is suitable for a separating wall within a residential property. The construction is based on a twin light steel frame with the insulation between these frames filled with insulation and then on the faces of the walls there are two layers of plasterboard on each side. The exact performance in terms of sound insulation will clearly depend on the specification of the individual materials used. But based on typical specifications it is expected that the sound insulation for this type of wall will be between 56 and 66 RW or the DNT plus CTR will be between 45 and 56 dB. This wall is also suitable for separating walls in a dwelling. However, this one only consists of one light steel frame. Again, there is insulation, this time placed between the vertical studs of the wall. And again, there is two layers of plasterboard on each side. However, this wall also incorporates a resilient bar, which is specially designed to reduce the passage of sound across the wall. Again, the exact specification will impact on the performance achieved. However, based on typical specifications, an RW of between 59 and 62 can be expected, and a DNTW plus CTR of between 47 and 51 can be expected. This type of wall is suitable for an internal wall. The performance expected with this form is not sufficient for a separating wall. The construction includes light steel vertical studs again with insulation between the studs, but in this case there is no resilient bar and there is only one layer of plasterboard on each side of the wall. The expected performance is an RW of between 40 and 50. This type of wall is very similar to the previous one shown. However, instead of a standard vertical steel stud, this one incorporates an acoustic stud, which has a specially designed web to reduce the passage of sound across the wall. Again, the specification of the individual components will impact the exact performance, but it is expected that an RW of 43 to 52 dB can be achieved with this form of wall construction. I have only shown a selection of the walls that can be constructed in steel frame buildings. There are many more available, but this gives you some idea of what can be achieved. Moving on now to look at the floors in steel frame buildings. There are two types of floors that we will look at. Separating floors between dwellings and internal floors, so a floor within a single dwelling. For the construction, again we are thinking about 
steel frame buildings. And common floors in these types of buildings will be composite floors supported on steel beams or precast units supported on steel beams. In terms of sound insulation performance, there are three important components to any floor construction. There's the structural part of the floor, the slab. There's the ceiling suspended below the floor and also any floor treatments applied above the floor. Here we have a composite floor supported on steel beams. This is suitable for a separating floor and consists of the composite slab formed on profile metal decking. Above that there is a floor treatment applied of which there are many types. Here we have a batten system shown. And below there is a suspended ceiling consisting of a plasterboard layer supported on a light steel metal frame. The exact specification, dimensions, density of all these products will go to contribute to the sound insulation achieved. The expected performance based on typical specifications for DNTW plus CTR is between 48 and 60 and for impact sound the LNTW value is between 25 and 50. This slide shows a slight variation on the previous slide with precast units supported on steel beams. There are many variables which can occur in practice such as the beam depth, the depth of the units, the precast units and the type of floor treatment applied and the ceiling finish applied. All of these will again go to impact the actual performance achieved in terms of sound insulation but typical values for DNTW plus CTR would be between 47 and 58 dB and for impact sound the LNTW would be between 39 and 60 dB. There are many variations of floor treatments which can be applied to the top of a slab in a steel frame building. There are three main categories of these types of floor treatments. A batten floor as shown in the photograph, platform floors and isolated screed treatments. The performance of each of these will depend on their specification but the important criteria are the degree of isolation that they provide, the mass of the system and the depth of the system. Here we have the three main types of floor treatment shown. Starting at the top with the batten floor consisting of a timber batten on a resilient foam strip and then the walking surface formed from standard chipboard applied to the top of the battens. The depth of the batten will impact the sound insulation achieved with this system as will the exact nature of the foam isolation strip. The platform floor shown below consists of the standard walking surface of tongue and groove chipboard but below that an isolating layer. In this case it's shown as mineral wool but could be some sort of foam layer as well. For both the batten floor system and the platform floor system a layer of plasterboard can be installed below the walking surface to add to the mass of the system and thereby increase the sound insulation achieved. The third image on the slide shows the isolated screed system. This consists of a sand and cement screed, a separating layer typically of foam or mineral wool construction and a waterproof membrane. The screed used in these systems could also be of a lightweight proprietary system. Impact sound is an important criteria for floor construction to address. This can be assisted by the suspended ceiling system used and also isolated screeds are particularly effective. However, impact sound is best treated at the source. There are a variety of proprietary products which can be used, the most common of these being resilient acoustic layers and also acoustic vinyl flooring which are commonly used in hospitals and schools to reduce impact sound. These can reduce the impact sound by 20 to 10 decibels. The types of ceilings applied in buildings can vary enormously. At one extreme, no ceiling can be specified where there is an exposed soffit. At the other extreme, solid plasterboard ceiling can be specified, which is common in residential buildings. And in office buildings, it is common to see suspended ceiling tiles on a metal frame system. Depending on what type of ceiling is in place will depend on how effective this is 
at increasing the sound insulation of the complete floor system. Some of the factors which need to be borne in mind with the effectiveness of the ceiling system will depend on the depth of the cavity between the ceiling layer and the slab layer above, the inclusion of any insulation material within this cavity zone, the mass of the ceiling layer itself, and whether the ceiling system incorporates any resilient bars. Reverberation sound can be reduced by the ceiling finish. Suspended ceiling tiles are particularly effective at reducing reverberation. This slide shows two ceiling systems that are commonly used in residential buildings. The first one is a metal frame system. So here we have two layers of plasterboard suspended from a metal frame system which is in turn suspended from the underside of the floor slab. The lower diagram shows a resilient bar system. As mentioned earlier, resilient bars are specifically designed to reduce sound transmission and therefore the inclusion of resilient bars can mean that maybe only one layer of plasterboard may be required. So having looked at the wall and floor constructions, we will now look at junctions and it is important that the junctions are considered carefully in order to minimise flanking sound. Therefore, the engineer must look at the detailing of the junctions to ensure that it is done correctly. There are a few principles that should be followed. Firstly, avoid any contact between wall and floor finishes to prevent sound transmission between the wall and floor. Fill gaps with acoustic sealant and any voids in the wall or floor constructions within the junction zone should be filled with mineral wool. Ensure that there are no boards continuous across separating walls or floors and any joints in plasterboards should be staggered. The following slides will show a few examples of junction details. Here we have the junction between a composite floor and a separating wall. There are several things to note about this detail. Firstly, a small gap has been left between the wall boards and the floor slab, and this has been filled with acoustic sealant. Secondly, the voids above the steel beam and between the profiled steel decking have been filled with mineral wool. And also, the voids either side of the steel beam web have been filled with mineral wool to prevent reverberation within the cavity. Here we have the junction detail of an external wall and a separating wall. Again, things to note here, joints between the plasterboard layers are sealed. There has been additional mineral wool applied to the cavity near the junction zone and that there is no boards continuous across the separating wall. This slide shows the junction of an external wall with a separating floor. Again, there are several items to note about this detail. The wall boards have been left slightly above the floor slab and this gap has been filled with acoustic sealant. Mineral wall inserts have been placed either side of the floor beam to prevent reverberation within the cavity. And the steel beam itself has been separated from the ceiling and wall board material by including a layer of mineral wool. It is important that any steel frame elements are incorporated into the acoustic solution. Common elements that need to be incorporated are steel columns and bracing elements. There are also smaller elements that should be considered in the acoustic solution, such as pipes and cables. This diagram shows how a steel column can be incorporated into the junction of separating walls. The column itself has been encased in a layer of mineral wool and so there is no direct contact between the wall boards and the steel column. Either side of the column web has been filled with mineral wool to prevent reverberation. And again, any joints in the plasterboard have been sealed properly. It is not just large elements such as columns which must be considered in the acoustic solution. Smaller elements such as electrical surfaces need to be considered as well. The acoustic performance of a light steel separating wall is dependent upon the layers of plasterboard either side. Where these layers of plasterboard have holes cut in them for electrical surfaces such as sockets, 
it is important that any material is reinstated so that the acoustic performance can be maintained. On this diagram you can see that additional layers of plasterboard have been installed behind the socket boxes. To assist with the prediction of the acoustic performance of steel frame constructions and particularly walls and floors, an online acoustic prediction tool has been produced. This tool is based on real test data taken from steel frame buildings throughout the UK. The results produced by this system are intended for estimation purposes only and not for detailed design. There are five different types of floors included within the system and these are all steel construction based floors. The user inputs the various parameters associated with the floor. This includes the floor construction, the ceiling type and also the floor treatment applied above the floor. Once the necessary data has been inserted by the user, the tool will give predicted acoustic performance. For the floor, it will give a DNTW plus CTR value, a DNTW value on its own, and also an impact value of LNTW. The system for walls is similar. In this case, there are four different steel frame walls that the user can select from and the user can then input the various parameters associated with that wall construction including different layers of boards, whether insulation is included or not, the stud depth etc. For walls the DNTW plus CTR value is given along with the DNTW value on its own. To show that this is not all just theory a series of case studies have been produced. These are published in SCI publication P317. The following slides will give some extract information from this publication. All the information is based on real buildings with real on-site test data presented. The waterfront in Grantham is a steel frame building with composite floors. Here, eight floor tests were carried out. The sound insulation of the floor for the airborne performance was 55 dB, achieving the 45 dB necessary. And the average result from the impact sound tests was 43 dB, again achieving the 62 dB which is necessary. St Peter's Court in Bristol is a steel frame building but this time with precast floors. Again, eight floor tests were carried out and the average for the airborne sound insulation was 54 dB. Again, this achieved the 45 dB and the impact performance was 47 dB. The Riverview development in Hereford is a steel frame building with fibre reinforced composite floors. Here again eight floor tests were carried out and the average result for the airborne was 56 dB and the impact was 38 dB. The Hounds Mill development in Basingstoke was a modular steel frame project and four floor tests were carried out. The average airborne performance of the floor was 53 dB and the floor sound impact value was 52 dB. Further details of all these projects and the details used for the wall and floor constructions is given in SCI publication 371. So in conclusion Steel frame buildings can be constructed to achieve high levels of acoustic performance. Thank you very much for listening and I hope you found the presentation informative.